you go to the grocery store and they're closed because they have no food. This starts a riot and you leave just in time. You get home and turn on the tap and no water comes out. Light switches don't do anything either. You've had no heat for a couple of years now and winters are cold. Government leaders seem powerless to improve things. What would you do? That was the situation for the Anasazi starting around 1130. Crop failures caused by a long drought, no wood for heat or building, and no wildlife to hunt. There were constant raids by other villages looking for food. Cocapelli seemed to ignore the leader's prayers and promises of rain and crops. Pilgrims and traders stopped coming to the Anasazi capital in Chaco Canyon. Residents slowly trickled away as the system broke down. Webster defines abandonment as the surrender, relinquishment, disclaimer, or cession of property. The word describes events in the Colorado Plateau in the 1100s and 1200s, but the story begins much earlier. In the desert, water is life. People have used scarce water resources to dry farm the arid southwest for thousands of years. Today, you see Chaco Canyon is a desert of red rock and sand. Most plants are low, scrubby, and undernourished. But during prehistory, many trees grew there. Water flows in Chaco Wash only after rains or during the spring snowmelt. Chaco gets just nine inches of annual rainfall. Not much compared to Denver's 15.8 inches or San Francisco's 20.4. But there is enough to lead people to Chaco's central location. The ancient water table was above arable farmland, so it was only a matter of time until some smart farmer figured out how to channel and store enough water from mesa tops and Chaco and Escavada washes to irrigate modest crops of maize, beans, and squash. When you're growing crops in a single location every year, you want permanent shelter nearby. Those first shelters began as pits in the ground. With enough wood, they could be walled and roofed against the sun's daily broil and wild night visitors. There was also a fire pit to cook year-round and heat in winter. Wood construction is a hazard when you're heating with fire. Most pit houses burn down either by accident or in raids by rival clans. To avoid accidental barbecues, people began lining pit houses with stone masonry. The pit house became the kiva, a central living space and a place to celebrate the gods. The people wanted to thank their gods when crops were good and plead for more rain when they were not. Probably under the influence of clan leaders, they began building monuments, great houses to the gods to guarantee better crops. Chaco had enough farmland to support maybe 250 people. Canyon population may have been as high as 2,500. So outlying regions probably traded their surplus crops into Chaco in return for early leadership and status. Before 900, Chaco Canyon may have served as a regional storehouse and distribution point for food surpluses. Parts of Chaco's first great houses probably were warehouses for that storage. Great houses became palaces housing the elite leadership when they were alive and tombs when they died. There must have been a division between the common majority living in small unit pueblos south of Chaco Wash and leaders living in great houses north of it. Archaeologist Stephen Lexon sees structural evidence for at least two rival leading groups at Chaco. One group was in favor of buildings aligned with the movements of the sun, the visible sign of the elements that brought water and food. Penasco Blanco and early Pueblo Benito aligned with the solar solstices facing southwest. The second group favored building alignments with the cardinal directions. Pueblo Alto and later additions to Pueblo Benito were built this way. However the leaders came to power, they made Chaco the center of the Anasazi world with the largest great houses anywhere. Chaco's Pueblo Benito great house was the tallest building in America until the first skyscrapers came to Chicago in the late 1800s. Chaco leaders also ushered in a marked decrease in violence across the Colorado Plateau between 900 and 1150. There truly was a Pax Chaco. To start with, Chaco possessed game for hunting and wood for shelter. The Chacoans stripped the trees in the canyon for fuel and building after a few centuries. Wood had to be cut and hand carried from the Chisca Mountains and other faraway locations for later construction of great houses. Penasco Blanco was another early great house, one of only two south of Chaco Wash. It's well known for the pictographs below it that may represent the Nova of 1054, which was visible day and night for several weeks, and the lunar eclipse of 1055.
Mesa Verde explorer Richard Wetherill first saw Chaco Canyon in 1895 when he guided his future wife and her family to the ruins. He wrote about the canyon to Talbot Hyde, who funded most of Wetherill's archaeological work. The ruins of Chaco being the greatest in New Mexico and almost unknown, I wished to examine them. I was successful after a few days' search in finding relics in quantity. The ruins there are enormous. There are 11 of the large pueblos or great houses containing from 100 to 500 rooms each. I stayed there until I had gotten 40 pieces of pottery. Photographer William Henry Jackson was the first white man to notice the ruin on the Mesa above Pueblo Benito in 1877. He didn't quite believe his guide's story of the ruin's name, so he called it Pueblo Alto. You reach Pueblo Alto, a neighboring New Alto, through a crack behind Quinquetzo. One set of prehistoric stairs descending a cliff at North Mesa has been named Jackson Stairs. <laughs> The North Road starts at Pueblo Alto and may have been the major route for southbound pilgrims and trade to Chaco. It's hard to discern today from the ground. You really need the sign. Leaders may have planned Chaco and Rhodes to cement the canyon's position as the center place. Roads extended in the cardinal directions from downtown Chaco. Most were around 20 feet wide, ruler straight over the landscape, and sometimes bordered by stone masonry walls. As Chaco became a regional capital, outlying pueblos grew around it. Many outliers connected to downtown Chaco by roads. Some of the outliers were apparently built as way stations for travelers to Chaco. One of these, Twin Angels, built around 1100, stands on a line above the likely course of the North Road in Cuts Canyon. There is no arable farmland near the ruin, no other reason for it to be there. Pierre's complex and halfway house outliers fall on the North Road, in a direct line to Twin Angels. There's evidence of repetitive wood burning from fires at Pierre's. It's possible that these fires allowed simple signaling across the mountains, mesas, canyons, and desert plains. The outlier furthest north was at Chimney Rock in southern Colorado. The small pueblo there aligned with the two rock chimneys in a direction to see the rising moon between them on the winter solstice. As Chaco grew, some groups moved out and built large colonial population centers. Many archaeologists suggest Chaco's population pressure and limited carrying capacity motivated the expansion to rivers 60 miles north. A large great house was built on the San Juan River between 1068 and 1100. It's called Salmon Ruin today, after the pioneer farmer who owned it in the late 1800s. Charred roof supports in Salmon's Tower Kiva indicate a violent attack, tree ring dated to 1285. Salmon was a little too close to the San Juan River. The land eroded away on its southern side. This may have been a reason for construction of the Aztec West Great House, starting around 1100, a few miles northeast and farther away from another river. Earl Morris grew up in the San Juan region and did more archaeology there than anyone in the early 20th century. Morris realized the significance of the great kiva at Aztec ruins after local settlers had taken building materials from it and wanted to tear the remains down. Morris directed the restoration of Aztec's great kiva between 1928 and 1934. He also helped stabilize ruins at Mesa Verde.
Four- and five-story buildings were built by making lower-story walls thicker to support the upper floors. Walls had veneers of shaped stone blocks with rubble cores. The Anasazi quarried sandstone blocks from canyon walls and cemented them with mud mortar. And they did all of this without power tools. On an 1887 trip with his brother Richard to show a visitor some cliff dwellings, Al Wetherill took a separate route from the others and found himself on Mesa Verde searching for ruins. It was almost dark, so he started to head back. He'd walked half a mile when he glimpsed a cliff ruin in the recesses of a huge cave. I stood looking at the ruins in surprised awe. I had hoped to find some dwellings, but this discovery surpassed my wildest dreams. I gauged the steep walls of the canyon in the ebbing daylight against my tired legs and slowly turned away. They would wait. They had waited for hundreds of years for the moment of discovery. It would be another year before Richard Wetherill and his brother-in-law Charlie Mason would return to explore Cliff Palace, Spruce Tree House, Balcony House, and other cliff dwelling. Mesa Verde provides strong evidence for the violence sweeping the Anasazi Four Corners in the 1100s and 1200s. The best-known ruins date from those years, and they're all built in defensible locations, usually on cliffs. Turkeys were kept behind the walls at Balcony House and elsewhere for meat and feathers to make cloaks. When they were available, the Anasazi hunted cottontails and jackrabbits, ground squirrels, and any other rodents they found in the canyon. The Anasazi were master builders who must have regarded the cardinal directions and movements of the sun and moon as sacred. The moon rises above particular windows in Kincletso and other pueblos during monthly lunar cycles. The most famous... Astronomical alignment is Fajada Butte's sun dagger, an interaction of light and shadow with petroglyphs showing the precise times of the solar equinoxes. Native Americans were prolific artists. Wherever there was a blank rock canvas, artists left their mark. They either painted or pecked their art, leaving a record of themselves and their activities. Archaeologists are unsure of the meaning of the drawings. Were they descriptions of epic hunts, records of ceremonies, or just graffiti? Flute player Cocopelli appears quite often along with handprints and human-like figures. Chaco had a long cultural reach. 
Ruins in Utah and northern Arizona show distinct Chakwin masonry, like these in Mystery Valley and Canyon de Chez. Some archaeologists place Mesa Verde, Canyon de Chez, and Chimney Rock within the 150-kilometer limit of trade with Chaco. Even without direct trade, there was Chakwin influence across the Colorado Plateau. Things began falling apart at Chaco and Aztec after 1150. Archaeologists cite many factors for abandonment of Chaco and most of the Colorado Plateau. There were many periods of severe drought between 1130 and 1300, enough to cause the failure of crops the Anasazi depended on. As we've seen, there was no wood left in the canyon for heating and cooking fires, and none for building. The trees you see along Chaco Wash today were planted by the CCC to halt erosion during World War II. There would have been fierce competition between overgrown populations for dwindling resources, resulting in warfare. Deformed and broken human skeletons litter many ruins after 1150. At Salmon Ruin, over 40 charred skeletons of children and adults were found in the Tower Kiva that burned around 1285. Salmon was abandoned shortly afterward. There is no mystery to the disappearance of the Anasazi, the ancestral Puebloans. Many of their descendants live in Hopi, Zuni, and other pueblos like Taos, Jemez, and Santa Ana along the Rio Grande in New Mexico. Historic Pueblo cultures live self-sufficiently, keeping populations low to match the carrying capacity of available land and resources. This is a sharp contrast to the overconsumption of the world around them. Modern Zuni and Hopi put it this way, We were here long before you came, and we expect still to be here long after you two are gone. 